most of these superhero characters who populate today's annually increasing influx of superhero movies were originally conceived and presented in comic books for children and teenagers. Some of them, such as Superman and Batman, were conceived as early as the 1930s, and others, such as Spider-Man and Iron Man, were conceived as late as the 1960s. But over the decades since, there's been a gradual transformation of these characters and their stories in movie form, so that they now appeal to and are marketed to adults as much as to children. The 2001 movie Unbreakable was filmed in a straight dramatic style, much more suitable to adults, and it carried a 12 certificate in the UK. Other superhero movies of recent times carry a 12 or 12A certificate, such as The Dark Knight. 2017's movie Logan has a 15-age certificate here in the UK, effectively shutting out child audiences from cinema screenings. While 2012's movie Dread carried an 18 certificate, but I don't personally view Dread as being a superhero movie, even though he has comic book origins. This shift in superhero movies and the widespread adult audience embracing of that change is something I find fascinating, much more fascinating than the movies themselves. So I've been taking a dive into watching lots of superhero movies lately to try and make sense of it all. I still have another dozen or so films on my research watch list, but have already reached enough conclusions to make a handful of videos on the subject. And one of those conclusions is that adults in today's world are feeling extremely cynical and powerless about the real world for a variety of reasons, but they also aren't being presented with convincing or inspiring movie heroes in other genres, and so they're turning in droves toward the previously child and teenage marketed genre of superheroes for emotional relief. It's not the only factor I see in why people are watching superhero movies. There are other factors, but this video is going to hone in on that subject. The first screen appearances of these superhero characters came mostly in animated forms, such as short films for cinema audiences and animated series for TV. But still, the target audience was children. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman! Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can, spins a web... Then came the first live-action incarnations with very limited old-school special effects and still totally aimed at child audiences, but with enough humour to make them just about watchable for adults too. As Batman and Robin, courageous warriors against crime, they are off once again to the rescue. Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray. But with the made-for-TV Spider-Man movies of the 1970s, an effort was made to be a little bit more serious. You're in love with the idea of happiness. But if some real joy comes along, you're so locked up in yourself you don't even recognize it. A chance for you to get some understanding of your real selves. Kill him. <laughs> But the big change came in the big budget Superman the movie in 1978. For the first time, a superhero movie was created that carried a great deal of entertainment value for kids and adults. In fact, arguably much of the film was so adult in its concepts and execution that adult audiences appeared to be the primary audience. The first 45 minutes is weighted with heavy tragedy from the destruction of a race to the protagonist suffering the death of two father figures. Much of the humour in the film is adult targeted too, jokes that kids probably wouldn't get. I have to leave you now. No hard feelings. We all have our little faults. Mine's in California. And a subliminal sexual encounter is presented as the superhero and his love interest flying together in the sky, as well as him being able to see her naked through her clothes. What color underwear am I wearing? I mean like a... Um... Pink. Um, sorry, Miss Lane, I didn't mean to embarrass you. And Superman's love interest is shown dying in a scene that's perhaps a bit too disturbing for kids. <laughs> Superman was as much an emotional and conceptual leap forward for screen superheroes as it was a special effects advancement. After some more superhero movies that lacked the same impact as Superman the movie, came Tim Burton's Batman in 1989, 
which did as much to transform that character's screen persona as Superman had done in 1978. Burton went for a literally dark and gothic presentation with the film noirish depiction of Gotham City. I was really looking forward to the movie when it was released. The, the hype was unbelievable, but apart from the excellent visual style and Jack Nicholson's Joker performance, I was very disappointed in the story and the Batman character. So I've only ever watched the film two or three times, and it doesn't do a great deal for me. However, both Superman 1978 and Batman 1989 balanced their dark and serious elements with a good dose of comedy. Superman also carried a very inspirational feel, which for me has been lacking in all of the Batman films, including Tim Burton's 1989 film. However, while all that was going on, in the 1970s and 80s, adult audiences had plenty of other cinematic heroes to be inspired by, from Charles Bronson's Vigilante in the early Death Wish movies, to James Bond, whose intellect was so high that we could virtually class him as a superhero. There was Indiana Jones, Mad Max, and various cop protagonists like in the Lethal Weapon and Die Hard films. And there were tons of famous martial arts movie and war movie protagonists whose antics were often so silly that the protagonists could be thought of as being superheroes. But somewhere in the 1990s, everyday human screen heroes started to fade away in cinema. And I'm not sure whether it's because audiences got tired of them and superheroes came along and filled the gap. Or if it's because superhero movies were being made that forced those everyday heroes aside. At the moment, I'm inclined to believe that a vacuum was created by a sudden drop in the quality of action and thriller filmmaking, because I still hear loads of people talk about the 70s and 80s as being the greatest era for screen heroes. Movies like Jack Reacher, The Departed and Upgrade have been pretty successful in recent years, but quality modern action movies are now a rarity, despite the market still being there if someone can put out a decent movie. Oh, and another factor is that when critics or audience polls are taken for greatest screen heroes of all time, non-superheroes usually rank very highly and often dominate the top 10. So it appears to me that superheroes have filled the screen hero vacuum, and the seeds for this were planted early on by Superman in 1978 and Batman in 1989, but it took a decade or so for it to start flourishing. Since these two milestone movies transformed screen representations of superheroes by marketing them towards adults, superhero movies have since been bounding around in terms of age appropriateness and level of seriousness in their themes. Sometimes the results have been marvellous. I particularly enjoyed multiple viewings of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 and Del Toro's Hellboy 2, and I was very intrigued by the experimental approach taken in Ang Lee's version of The Hulk. And I very much enjoyed the inventiveness of the first three Iron Man films, especially the action scenes in the third film of that series. They were pretty inventive in places. But at the same time, I grew quickly tired of the new superheroes for adults genre. I've watched the genre settle into a very expensive but conceptually dull assembly line of movies in which the scripts, direction, special effects, music, cinematography and even the action choreography have become so utterly predictable from one moment to the next that I can barely manage to sit through most new superhero movies at all, even the ones that the critics highly rate and which have achieved massive box office success. I enjoyed about 20 odd minutes of scenes from The Dark Knight and found the rest of the film utterly bland. Second and third viewings didn't improve my opinion of it, nor have the many emails I've received describing the film's apparent merits. In preparation for watching this video, I tried watching Black Panther because it had been so highly rated across the board, and I turned it off about half an hour in because all I was seeing was one cliché after another. Sure, it's nice to see a movie that gets so much African culture on screen, but that's not enough to make it a good movie. I much prefer Blade 1 and 2 in terms of black protagonist superheroes. Wesley Snipes was great in those, and the movies were well made. Now before I more thoroughly explain my take on the core psychological function of today's superhero mega genre, I just want to dispel a few alternate theories that I'd considered and which might come up in the comments section of this video. First of all, the assumption that superhero films are now big books because of the kiddie audience. 
As I've already cited, a lot of superhero movies now shut children out of cinema screenings on account of age certification, and this is a trend that I anticipate will continue given the commercial success of the film Logan. In addition, fully animated superhero movies like The Incredibles have been hugely successful in targeting child audiences. And yet, most new superhero movies are at least part live action. Most of them feature actual actors. If it was really a kiddie audience, then why not just do them all as completely animated? Another assumption we could make is that with superhero movies, the comic book original stories have already been established, giving a strong market for each character, and so studios are more willing to take the investment risk. This is tempting to believe, but there are also lots of video game characters that have huge market following, but the movie adaptations aren't mind-blowing or even memorable. I mean, I would love to see the main storyline of GTA V turned into a, a movie or a TV series. If it was done well, that could be amazing. And there are lots of other non-superpower fiction heroes to choose from that would be cheaper to put on film because less special effects would be needed. Jack Reacher was a good example of that, and the first film was very successful. And that brings me to another disposable theory, the special effects appeal. Science fiction and horror have just as much scope for showing off special effects, so special effects are not the core appeal of superhero movies either. I did read one article online that mistakenly assumed that the pursuit of justice is what makes superheroes popular, but that's definitely not the central appeal because justice can be served often more convincingly in other genres, be they courtroom dramas or basic action movies. It's also tempting to think that superhero films are more dramatic, but they're not. Drama works more effectively when the situations and the physicality of the protagonists are realistic and thus more emotionally convincing. So that's not the appeal. No, my present view is that the core appeal of today's superhero movies is that they are physical power fantasies which emotionally compensate for the lack of influential power that audiences feel in the real world. That's the function it serves for kids who feel powerless in the world compared to adults. And I think that core appeal remains for the adult audiences today. The impossibility of superheroes renders them mostly pointless in terms of inspiration to action in the real world because real people, audiences, could never perform the way these fiction characters do. No, I consider the genre to be raw escapism in the absence of realistic movie heroes. Escapism from the negativity and corruption that we perceive in the real world, negativity that is fed to us constantly by a news media that pushes fear and hopelessness for the most part, and at worst, seeks to destroy the reputations of everyday individuals whose actions might otherwise inspire the masses to pursue greater control of their own destinies. I consider superhero movies to hold the same kind of psychological function that musical movies used to provide during the misery of wartime and economic depression. A couple of hours of hope and happiness escapism, the fantasy of being able to easily influence the world through simple physical actions, with particular emphasis on physical damage resistance and, for some reason, acrobatics. Sometimes these action scenes are like watching the gymnastic competitions at the Olympics. But the strange and funny thing for me is that while movies like Superman 1 and 2 start off as dark and tragic stories and then turn into one of very positive and inspiring triumph of good over evil at the end, Today's superhero movies mostly wallow in cynicism and negativity from beginning to end. To me, that defeats the point of them being superhero movies at all. Superheroes were originally much more positive, and the bright colours of their outfits both made them stand out visually and conveyed that positivity. But look at superhero movies now. Batman looks like a gimp, and Superman's colours have been toned down to the point of being dank and drab. He's more black than blue, and his cape looks dirty. Both of these characters do far too much moaning as well, so I don't find them inspiring at all. Batman virtually never smiles or laughs, which is probably why I've never been able to take to him, except for the hilarious Adam West version where the humour was thankfully intended. Most superhero movies are now severely lacking in humour, which was why I found the first two Hellboy movies to be a breath of fresh air. They were really funny. The overwhelming effort to create consistently serious superhero stories falls flat on its face for me because I don't see any real conceptual difference between this and 
and this. Now I can suspend my disbelief in the silliness and enjoy a good superhero action scene. The train fight in Spider-Man 2 was incredible, I really enjoyed that. But a major problem with the new superhero movies for me is that they try to be serious and moody and cynical for the entire runtime. Even if it's just a straight up dialogue scene explaining some simple plot points, it still all has to be moody and serious. Whereas the superhero movies that I like to watch, such as the first two Spider-Man films, the Christopher Reeves era Superman films, and the Iron Man and Hellboy films, they vary the emotional tone throughout the runtime. They reserve the seriousness for the most appropriate scenes. But when a director tries to make the entire runtime one big, cynical, serious, and moody jerk-off, it has the opposite effect on me so that I can't take any of it seriously. Have you noticed that the best Batman films are the ones that have a funny and charismatic Joker character? That's because he provides a bit of balance, and that's why he's getting his own separate movie coming up as well, and I actually look forward to that one, even though Christopher Nolan is producing it. All of this minute-by-minute -minute superhero negativity, which is at its worst in the Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder superhero films, creates a contradiction with the positive fantasy of having superpowers. I'm tempted to call them cynical hero films or miserable hero films. The negativity is present in the dark lighting and dull cinematography, it's present in the drab colours of the costumes, it's present in the constantly moody facial expressions, and the often comical verbal attempts to imitate the dialogue style of Clint Eastwood. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. You wanted me. Here I am. Why do you want to kill me? <laughs> and it's present in the not-so-happy endings. Now sure, what I've said here is going to annoy a lot of you out there who enjoy those films, but I know that I'm not the only one who feels like this. Because I've heard others say the same, and because it seems that the genre is actually now splitting into two distinct subgenres: The miserable, cynical, moody camp, exemplified by Nolan and Snyder's films, and the deliberately comical send-ups of the genre such as Super... Kick-Ass, and Deadpool. To an extent, the latter three movies tentatively acknowledge the powerless audience motive, but although I find them more enjoyable films to watch, I also consider them a bit of a marketing deception, which I won't go into right now. Now, what I would much rather see is the movie industry getting back to making movies about more convincing, reality-based heroes whose superpowers lie in their character and conviction, not in magical physical abilities or God-given intellect. I have lots more to say on the subject, so if you want me to make more videos on superhero movies, then do consider becoming a monthly supporter of mine on Patreon, and be sure to check my backlog of film analysis videos and articles on my site, collativelearning.com. Links are in the video description below. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Thanks for watching.